You're listening to RTLSA. And as you have become accustomed to, we have the most amazing guests joining us on RTLSA all the time. And none more amazing than Mr. Darren Scott himself joining me today. Darren, welcome to RTLSA and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Noel. Nice to be with you. Where are you in the world at the moment? Are you in Hot Beersport? No, no. I left there about five years ago. Oh my goodness. Um, in Daneford, I'm uh, living now in Daneford, have been for about the last four, four and a half years. Okay, it obviously shows how long it's been since I caught up with you. What have you been up to, Darren? Uh, still doing radio, like doing, uh, doing the radio thing. So at the moment, I'm uh, doing the drive show on Mix 93.8 in Joburg and have been doing that for just over a year now. But I've been, been back with Mix about, I think it's going on three, maybe four years now. Yeah, and you've been in the industry for a lot longer than that. I mean, when when did you start in the industry? Yeah. I mean, it's like you you've been a household name for many many years already. I started in 1984. In fact, uh, from uh, this week, uh, it was actually funny. A couple of days ago, I put together a thing called the Capital Countdown, which is uh, a chart show used to happen on Capital Radio when I was you know from this day one, um, which Kevin Savage used to do quite a lot of that time. So there's a Capital Radio website um, and Facebook group and uh, they post the old countdowns, top 40s every uh, every week. So we decided let's actually do a package one as a countdown, as a show. So I did the first one uh, on uh, on Wednesday uh, and that brought back some nice memories. But yeah, that started for me in 1984. I was there uh, for seven years. Seems like seven years has been a standard period for my radio career i was a capital before i went off to the states my dad lives there in, uh, in the states has been for a while so i moved over to the states for a year um i had a green card then decided i didn't like it there so i came back gave the green card back and i've been here uh ever since then and uh oh, then it was a stint it's a couple of stints at 702 and then 5fm in the mid to late 90s and then uh went along uh, the Regional radio route with East Coast Radio, Jack Aranda, uh, then Hot 91.9, and now at uh, Mix FM. This is my second stint at Mix. was there in 2014, mm. and the 2013, 2014, and now back there from uh, since 2017, and still there today and loving it. Now, I've also considered you to be sort of a pioneer when it comes to visual radio, which is what I'm doing at the moment. And you started all the f- with balls back in the day. Um, what was the thinking behind it? Because I know why I do it, but what were you thinking back then when it was really something unknown? Well, it was kind of an avenue for me and my team. You know, I'd, uh, I had a full team of uh, of people that were that were working through my business. So through radio, a lot of my stuff has been. You know, I've had my own business too as a foundation. We used to do a lot of our own um, creative advertising sales around features and things on my show. So I've, I've always I've had that since the late '90s in the Five FM days, and uh, so I had this team and I had this this business when I left Jacaranda, and you know someone called me and actually said, uh, in fact it was Henny Larue, the rugby player, who called me and said, look, there's this guy Doug Reed that wants to uh, get together and meet you. He's got an idea, and he literally just was throwing around a, a, an idea about you know, there's no sports media anywhere. There's no sports radio anywhere in this country, which is crazy. I mean, it's a sports mad country and we don't have sports radio here. So uh, he just kind of tossed the idea out there and I left that meeting going, okay, well, we can put something like that together um, as an online station because obviously trying to get a license in this country is impossible. very prohibitive. You have to go through your costs, which a lot of people don't understand. You don't just switch on and open a radio station. You've got to go through a uh, process is like uh, pulling all your teeth out. Um, so we literally put a proposal together, sent it to Doug, and, uh, and 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 came up with this idea of Balls Radio, which is basically sports radio. But um, there was a lot of this visual radio sort of stuff taking off in the USA uh, and overseas. So it would be nice to actually step into that territory as well, have cameras in the studio so people could watch what's going on as well. And because it was sports, and there's so much stuff available on the internet. Uh, I remember our first first interview, one of our first interviews we did on day one was, uh, I think it was Larry Mize who, who won the Masters 
uh, many, many years ago, and uh, we've been given an interview with him. So I thought, well, it'd be nice while we're talking to, to show him actually winning the Masters. Mm. And that's where the visual aspect helps. And then when you're playing songs, you know, for people that are that are listening, some people are, you know, watching as well. Instead of watching nothing while the song's playing, play the music video. So we started doing that kind of thing. And, you know, slowly just sort of, it was really experimenting and dabbling with the visual radio side of things um, and developing that kind of idea, you know, in a, in a very prohibitive market. The, uh, um, and I mean, you guys will understand as well. In South Africa, you know, the online, the online world hasn't really taken off the way it has in other parts of the world. And sometimes it's very prohibitive. The costs are very prohibitive as well. So, you know, as much as we had to visual things, sometimes you had a handful of people that might have been watching. You had another few more people that were listening. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that was, that was a good two years of, you know, getting sort of that platform built. And then we started going into the syndication thing where we started syndicating our product back to, uh, you know, normal radio stations and community radio stations around the country, um, which led us back into this kind of world where I am now. Awesome. Now, obviously, you uh, radio radio was the thing that really got, put you on the map, but you then took it at other level and went into television and um, obviously did a lot of stuff with Super Sport and uh, Boots and all and things like that. Which is your favorite medium? Do you have a favorite or do they oh, each yeah. have their merits? Uh, there's only one. For me, it's radio. So okay. um, at the moment, I mean, there's a couple of exciting projects that I'm busy with at the moment. So one of them is it's not television, um, but obviously it's, uh, it's digital television. It's a, it's a new show that I'm busy. Uh, we've already done the pilot for it and that hopefully we'll be going, getting going as soon as the rugby season kind of gets going again. So that's very exciting, but I've, I've never really, you know, I never got into television on purpose. I got in there by being conned by one Manu Padiachi, uh, who worked with me at Capital Radio back in the day when Mnet started. I never ever wanted to be on television. I love radio. You know, I just got into Capital in 84 and I think 86 was when they started going around radio stations looking for presenters for Mnet. And uh, they wanted radio people because radio people can basically talk shit when things go wrong. <laughs> so when they're fixing something in the back room, you've got some guy that can sit there and rabbit think, on for on as spot. long as they need to fix it. Yeah, exactly. Ad lib. So uh, they went, they, they, they deliberately went to find radio people. They went to 702, they came to Capital. They've got Kevin Savage, they've got Manu Padiachi, uh, Paul Freethy, um, Paul West, as he was known then. Guys like that who all uh, who all worked in radio as presenters, and they had asked me to go for a, a screen test, and I said no, I wasn't interested, and um, I left it at that. And then about it was about not even a year later, Manu kept coming to me and saying, "There's this lady Margot that keeps saying I must come for a screen test," and I kept saying no. Then he came to the one day and said, no, they're thinking of starting a sports offering on, super, on, on Mnet. There was no super sport then. Mm. Um, and they really would like me to be the, the face of their sports offering. And I thought, okay, well, that's something different. And it's, you know, I'm not sitting there introducing um, like B-grade movies and stuff like that and 1960s TV series and things mm. that they were running in those days. So I, um, I decided, okay, for sports thing, I'll go and do a, a quick screen test and uh, I went in on a Saturday morning uh, dressed up and ready to go for a sports audition or whatever it was and there were like hordes of people waiting there they all had scripts in their hand and there were scripts for dynasty and all kinds of normal programming I got given a script as I arrived and I looked at the only sport there was yachting so I was going to leave I was literally <laughs> going to walk out I remember Ralph Margaret the producer at the time he said listen just do it you're here now just do it, give it a bash, and then, you know, you hear, yeah, so what, what have you got to lose? So I thought, okay, so they took me straight in, and I took the piss. I literally took the piss. I wasn't interested. I was sitting there. <laughs> um, I had all the stuff. I did the intros for all of these things, and I literally just ripped it apart. And when I walked out, the one controller, Andre Engelbrecht, was standing there, hosing himself, laughing. And as I walked out, he just said, I said, okay, I think we'll be seeing you in a couple of weeks. And I thought he was mad. I'm like, yeah. I literally took, took the absolute mickey out of this whole audition process. 
And lo and behold, the week after that, I got a call from him saying, okay, we wanted you to come on and board as a presenter. So <laughs> I started doing, introducing <laughs> things like My Little Pony and Friends and all of that nonsense and late night movies for a, a good uh, couple of years before Supersport took me on after that uh, when they started MNET Supersport. Yeah, I was only too happy to get out of that side of MNET and get into the Supersport side. And those were, yeah, um, those were 20... Whew, um, I think it's 23 yeah. and super sport, 27 all together at Mnet. Those are some really fun times, a lot of travel. Um, yeah, and I, I enjoyed it, but all the time doing radio at the same time. It's two mm. completely different things. In television, you rely on 20 other people um, for the way you want something to, you know, the direction you want to take something. 20 other people, you've got to make sure they're on the same page as you. In radio, as you sit there now as well, Okay, you might have someone cutting cameras. I don't know how you guys do it there. But in radio base, you sit behind a desk, you can wear shorts, you don't need makeup, and you turn the mic on, you play the song, and you're your own boss, and it's your own mind process, your own thought process, how you start a show and where you take a show, in what direction you take it. It's all you. And I think that's the part I love about it. And especially being online as well, you've got a lot of flexibility and a lot of versatility as well. Yeah. I'm a one-man show. I'm wearing socks and shorts as we speak. <laughs> no cameras on my legs. <laughs> Darren, you yeah, managed good. You managed to, uh, uh, what I would assume, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you have two passions in life. Well, one of your two big passions in life would obviously be music and sport. And you found a way to, throughout your media career, merge the two. How did you yeah. go about that? Was it just a matter of luck? No, it just happened. I mean, those are two, those are two of my passions. Um, I would say music slightly ahead of sports. But, you know, when, when I was at 5FM, uh, I inherited, you know, when I moved on to the afternoon drive show, uh, obviously doing weekend breakfast, there's always a sport element in there. But it's nice to be able to interact with your sports guy as well. Um, when you're doing it, you're not just introducing him. He does the sport, he finishes, you go and you carry on with the show. You know, it was nice to interact with there was something, in, and sport always offers something to talk about in this country. And although I've never really, except for 702 for a year, I've never really worked on talk radio. I don't really want to. Um, it wasn't a talk show, but, you know, you start to throw ideas out there and people love to join a debate about sport all the time. So you get a good re response from listeners. And then when I moved to the afternoon drive show, They'd already had the sports hour, um, which Glenn Hicks and Louis Carpers had, uh, I think, started doing. And that was still going. When I took over the drive show, Anthony Duke, the station manager, said, listen, you're taking that hour as well. So you and John Walland will present the sports hour together, which was fine. John sorted out the interviews. We interviewed two or three guys a day. But we'd have fun with it as well. You know, any, and even with my TV presenting as well, um, I think the, the, the point of difference that I did bring to it is because from the beginning, I didn't take this job seriously and I didn't want the job. So I always brought an element of irreverence to whatever I did. You know, and for me, being on television, being on radio, it's about entertainment. So it doesn't matter what the memo in the office says or from above says, the person that turns on the television or turns on the radio does that for two reasons, informed and entertained. Mm. And that memo has never changed. Whatever people's strategies and and, and uh, all of their focus groups and all that stuff that they, they pull into a room and give them free pizza and a Coke and they tell, tell you how you should do stuff. When people sit in the car or sit in their lounge and turn the thing on, they will select something that is entertaining or will inform them, one of the two or both. And that for me was very important. So for me, television presenting always had to be entertaining. Uh, try and keep it light, even if we were getting hammered by the All Blacks or whatever it was. Um, and that's the way I've always presented. And from a radio point of view, we had a lot of fun doing the sports hour. So, you know, that was a big part of uh, the, gee, I think it was, I uh, started that in 2000, 1998. So it was four years on the afternoon drive and the sports hour, which became sports tracks uh, in the end. And then, um, you know, I've always done breakfast shows. I've always done drive shows. So I've always had a sports element with our sports guys in there. But this is the first time I did sports radio, obviously, was with balls. But the music element was very important. So it was, always, it was like an extended sports hour show. So, you know, there'd be a couple of songs, then an interview with somebody. But the nice thing about the kind of radio that 
you doing now the visual radio, but also just the online thing, is that you're not you're not handcuffed by anybody. You've got no one telling you you can't say this, you can't criticize this, you can't do this this way, and also you've got three minutes to get this interview done because you've got to go on to some some other thing. You know, if an interview is going really well, you're talking to a uh, a legendary sports star or a Nick Mallet or whoever it is, and he's getting stuck in, and you're not having anyone handcuffing you, you can let that go for 10, 15 minutes sometimes. As long as it's engaging and you can feel it's engaging, you can let it run. So that's the freedom that the internet does give you. And, uh, you know, and uh, obviously on, 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 on terrestrial radio, it's a little bit more limited because if you're on a music station, people want to hear music, you want to talk ad nauseum. Mm. But sports has always been a, a thread through all my shows. Um, and, uh, you know, as long as I'm doing it, that's the way I'd like to keep it. What has been a highlight for you? Something, something that you probably would never have done if it hadn't been for your media career. I uh, probably would never have met uh, probably one of the great, if not the greatest man to ever live. Talking about human beings, uh, Nelson Mandela. Um, and I had an hour with him on my show when I was at five, uh, but it was only about sports as well. So in the, for the sports hour, what I'd done beforehand in uh, in the nineties, when because I had my own production company when I started with Super Sport, I produced uh, the sports talk show Super Saturday. And those were my TV shows, so I had my own production company, and I wanted I had this idea to do a documentary about sports on Robben Island and the role that it played, mm. um, you know, and how they did their sport. So it was a documentary purely about sports in Robben Island. And I went to Robben Island four times, went with people like Tokyo Sequali, Terry Lakota. Um, a lot of the former prisoners went with us and we filmed this documentary. I remember David O'Sullivan joined me for a few. And we put together this really nice documentary about sports in Robben Island. Absolutely fascinating stories. And also how they use sport to, as part of their way of, you know, getting around the authorities and communicating with each other. Because at Robben Island, the ANC, the PAC, and Swapa were like in their separate section. They were kept apart, so they couldn't communicate. This is all part of the whole, the whole setup. They didn't want these guys communicating with each other and, and plotting and doing stuff. So, you know, they used an old tennis court where they used to go and play tennis. And they did they had people playing tennis there but they used to go and watch them but sitting on this tennis court there was a drain uh, in the one corner and they'd go and sit around this drain but meanwhile they'd cracked the lid and they'd opened it slightly and while they're watching this tennis match going on and the, the, the you know the, the cops just think that all the prison warders just thought that they were just sitting watching a game of tennis uh the guys up at the the swapo block or the pac block had flushed a uh, a, a note down the toilet attached to some thread and this would be going down the <laughs> the drain and it would pass under the tennis court so someone would be watching the drain to see when this thing would would reach there and as soon as it came past they'd grab the thread and pull it out and then they'd get a note from the PAC and all of this using a tennis match as a smoke screen so I mean those and that's just one of amazing stories the stories about how Mandela used to drive people nuts playing chess and they used to play chess in Three, in three different cells. So the one person was sitting in one cell, the other one was in another cell, and they have a third person in the middle to make sure that either person wasn't cheating. Um, and that's they, had, they had to do it because they didn't want them together because, you know, they didn't want people communicating. Yeah. And he used to drive everyone nuts. He used to play mind games so they would always win. And um, so when we had him in, at, at five, we organized it through Zelda. We got a full hour with him in the studio and um, it was absolutely amazing. It was uh, just about sport. We didn't talk any politics. We didn't talk about anything else. We spoke about, about Robin Island, some of the aspects that I learned through that documentary. And it was just the most amazing hour of radio that I've ever been privileged to do. Uh, he was fantastic. Uh, the stuff he said about the 95 Springboks mm. really resonated with me so, so much. Um, I still haul it out every now and again, you know, on anniversaries and play some of the clips from that. And then the, I think the other one was obviously 9-11 where I was on air when it was all happening. Wow. And I literally had to change. I changed my show immediately from being the drive show on five to a CNN type show where we were getting all this information coming through one by one. 
And uh, we were just sharing this with people because for us, this was like the end of the world was starting. And that at the end of it, I was exhausted, but it was such a, uh, I just felt like it, it, we'd done like news radio yeah. uh, in our own way, you know, without having planned it at all. I literally heard about the, the first plane going into the, the first tower, um, I think 17 or 16 minutes before I went on air while I was on my way driving into the building. And uh, I literally just had to switch like that. I would count those two as probably two highlights from a radio point of view. Um, television, I've done a couple of World Cups. I think 2007 was uh, was particularly one good one um, where, you know, we won it. And I anchored that whole World Cup, which was fantastic. And that was after having taken a sabbatical. I came back in 2006 and then got to anchor a World Cup win in 2007. And then, you know, some of the more controversial shows I did on Sports Talk, like the Louis Late interview I did, where, I mean, the man was, he's a very tricky guy to interview. You know, for me, I was still young then, and I, I took him on and uh, I, I built a respect with him. He always respected me after that, but geez, he gave me a hard time in that interview. And uh, the Andre Best, the Andre Markroff, uh, you know, debacle where we had one each of them at the studio but in separate rooms not knowing that they were both there and they wouldn't sure. come on air together and, and so yeah i mean there were there were some great moments in television as well but i think from a broadcasting point of view mandela and uh, 9-11 were the two big ones yeah, well i can imagine i'm um, just having nelson Mandela walk into your studio the presence that he must have brought in with him must have been absolutely incredible no he didn't bring us any presence i was very disappointed <laughs> no, goodness um darren um, I've just got to tell you a little story because I, I've met you a few yeah. times over the years. Most recently was at the Sharks Golf Day, I think, at Bushwick a few years ago. And, wow, okay. And I, yeah, yeah. And then when I worked at the yeah. SABC as well, uh, ran into each other every now and then. But the reason I'm telling the story was, and you probably won't remember it, but you are responsible for one of my most embarrassing moments in life ever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and it wasn't your fault it was me it was me i was i was the idiot when you were with 5fm you guys were doing a you guys were traveling a little bit and um you guys came to news cafe at sun city at one point and did your show yeah, I remember. There from news cafe i remember now, that yeah. i was the manager of that store at that time still young and green and okay. just, before, just before i went into my radio career and um I went to now the only reason I'm telling the story is because people have been hounding me to tell the story. <laughs> but I went into the yeah. I went into the loo at one point and you were in there. And what do we do as men? Uh, we just like greet each other and I turn around to you and I say to you, Darren, cool show. And you turn around to me and you say to me, No, like a restaurant. And my thought process at the time was I shouldn't say what I'm about to say, but then I said it. I said to you, How did you know my name? And you turned around to me and said, you're wearing a name badge, idiot. <laughs> I can't remember if you said the word idiot, but that's what I felt like. <laughs> but that's the type of personality. Yeah, uh, and then you had, I can tell you you had to be because I'm terrible at remembering names. I, I, that's one of my horrible traits is that someone, I'll in, get introduced to someone and literally five minutes later, I've uh, got to ask my fiance or someone with me to go, please introduce yourself or like find their name. If we're not interview people, they... They, they come into the studio, you meet them, and you get busy with something. And I don't know what it is, but I am terrible with names. Uh, and you know, some people get offended by it, but literally it's not it's not deliberate. It's just I'm not, you know, being blase about it. I have no way of remembering names. So you had to be wearing a name badge. <laughs> no, well, just bringing it back to the type of character you are. Quick on the spot, um, always friendly and willing to share a conversation. And one of the nicer people I've ever met, although I have not got to know you. It's just the, the type of person you are in your presence. You just seem to be very forthcoming and very accommodating and very friendly. And um, I'd like to, yeah, yeah. on that note, thank you very much for joining us today. It was so cool to have you on the show. And what, what have you got planned now going forward? Just in, just in closing, obviously we've got COVID, which is a big thing that's influencing our careers at the moment. What have you got yeah. in, on the cards? Well, I've been very lucky that, you know, a lot of the, I mean, you know, the radio industry is, is relies on advertising and sponsors and stuff. And everyone's been hit by that because a lot of our advertising and sponsorship is based around entertainment areas and people mixing in groups and, you know, so all your restaurants, pubs, casinos, all those people have had to suspend campaigns 
So every radio station has had to, you know, has, has seen their sort of uh, advertising revenue drop. I'm very, I was very fortunate that, uh, first of all, you know, my show is sponsored by The Courier Guy and they have seen an increase in business over the lockdown because obviously people are using courier more to like get stuff as opposed to dropping it off themselves. So I was very blessed on that side of things that my sponsor was, was staying busy. Um, but the other side is obviously with this technology, um, literally sitting where I am now, I did much of my drive show and mix from home for, for two and a half weeks. And the nice thing about it was it created new ideas. As, as someone actually said to us, it's like having Paul's radio back again, because I was doing my interviews now on Zoom before the show. I spoke to a lot of the musos. We did a lockdown chain series. Um, where we spoke to a lot of the musicians through our charity thing, One Wings of Change. We helped a lot of musicians as well. Um, we did, you know, did a lot of lockdown type stuff um, that that fitted the format of the show. So it, it actually made me busier than, than normal, which was uh, which was fantastic. And um, now we're back at the studio again, but a lot has come out of it. So we've got a lot of stuff. Our One Wings of Change is my my charity initiative, which has been going since the ball stage 2012, and that is very busy at the moment because masks and we've 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 done desks and furniture for so many communities. We've just built a kitchen in Alex for a, for a feeding scheme there. So that is incredibly busy. Um, as I say, there's a couple of good projects. One, I can't reveal what it is, but uh, it's, it's, a, it's probably one of the biggest projects from a radio point of view that I'm, uh, that I'm working on at the moment. And hopefully soon uh, there will be some kind of a you know, resolution to that. And um, and then, as I say, this this potential TV show, which is now looking very realistic, uh, but not on television. It's a digital TV show, which will be a weekly show, and that's coming up very soon. As I say, as soon as rugby starts gaining some momentum again, but even before then, that will probably get underway uh, with quite a big rugby brand. So those are the things that are coming up. So yeah, I've been blessed. You know, I know there are a lot of people that have been hit hard by lockdown, where things have shut down. And, uh, and I can only consider myself blessed that I can keep going and keep doing what I love doing. Well, Darren, thank you very much for joining us again. And we look forward to hearing all your um, plans unfold going forward. Thank you. I look forward to sharing those. And uh, appreciate you inviting me onto your show. And all the best for you and, uh, and what you guys are doing. And uh, yeah, I appreciate, appreciate the invite. Awesome. Thank you very much. Right, that's Darren Scott joining us on RTLSA and RTLSA.